we're going to be, uh, as I said, continuing looking at spiritual authority. And with spiritual authority, we need to grow in spiritual authority. Because if we don't grow in spiritual authority, what will happen is we will remain defeated Christians. The enemy will always try to put you down. I think we understand that. We know that experientially, that the enemy is just always trying to put us down, keep us downtrodden. He's always trying to get his foot on the back of our neck. And uh, if we don't understand the spiritual authority that we have in Jesus Christ, then we're just going to continue to allow the enemy to have reign over our life unless we do something about it. And through Jesus, of course, he has done something about it. And he's given us the power and the authority to execute uh, that on our behalf. So we need to realize that the authority that we have in Jesus Christ has been given to us for a reason. A Christian that knows the authority they have will be able to overcome the enemy and be far more effective in ministry that we've been called to. Would you agree with that? Yeah? yeah? yeah. I think that's true. As a born-again believer, you actually have far more control over your life and over your circumstances than you might realise because you have authority in Jesus Christ. And as you begin to exercise your spiritual authority, you will start to live in the kingdom of heaven and not under the kingdom of darkness. You'll begin to experience what it is to be free as a child of God. So this is important. It's an important thing that we understand that authority. Understand the authority that Jesus not only has won for us and the authority that he has, but also the authority that he has given to us in his name. So last week we explored creation authority and we'll just throw a slide up there behind me so that, that will remind you of what we looked at last week. So we came to the fact that God has ultimate authority. When Jesus came, he then had delegated authority directly from God. But as we saw, as we looked through the Eden narrative, the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, we found that Adam and Eve surrendered their authority and the power which God had given to them originally to the devil. That authority which God had given Adam and Eve was so that they would look after creation. He gave them authority and power to look after all of creation and to go out into the whole world and to fill it and to bring it under the rule and the reign of God. That was the purpose of them having that authority. But of course, they gave that up. Adam and Eve listened to the serpent and in doing so, surrendered that authority to the devil. And we know because we've read scripture and there's many, many places that we read this, is that from that time, people have been born under Satan's rulership because of sin, because we've been slaves to sin. We've been in that prison cell, if you like, that, uh, that uh, Ray was sharing about. Right? That prison cell is a picture of what it is to be born as a human being underneath the power of sin. You're in prison, in prison, slavery to sin. And Jesus, as we know, through the power of the cross and through his blood, through that sacrifice of himself, broke the power of sin for us. Mm -hmm. So we see with Jesus, as he comes into the earth, Jesus comes to be the king and he comes to extend his kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now, we're in the Advent season, right? We're in week two of Advent because it actually started earlier this year because Christmas doesn't fall on neatly on a Sunday. So uh, actually the first week of Advent was last Sunday. So we're actually in the second week of Advent this, uh, this Sunday. And so it's appropriate as we start to look at the king and the kingdom or the kingdom authority that we actually have a look at some of the things that surrounded Jesus' birth, some of the things the scripture teaches us and tells us about Jesus. So we're going to have a look at the first one, which comes from Isaiah, chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah prophesied about a child that would be born that was both human and divine. So Isaiah writes, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, 
and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So this Son of Man, this person that was to be born, was destined to rule and reign over his people. So we see right here that Isaiah is prophesying in the Spirit of God that the one who was to come would be a ruler. The government would rest upon his shoulders. So that's the kind of authority that we're looking at. It's a governmental authority, an authority that is there to rule and to reign and to create power, to create government. He doesn't say that this person was going to be a wise man. He doesn't say that he was going to be just a moral teacher. He doesn't say that he was even going to be a prophet. But this person who was to come was going to be a king and he was going to reign over his kingdom. In Luke 1, verses 32 and 33, this is the story of the Annunciation. This is where the angel Gabriel comes and visits Mary, mother of Jesus, and proclaims to her that she is going to have a son. And the angel Gabriel spoke to Mary, saying, He, meaning Jesus, will be very great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. So that's what the angel Gabriel said. Now, Gabriel is an archangel. Gabriel was a, uh, wasn't just your common or garden angel, as if there is such a thing. <laughs> this was the angel Gabriel. This was one whom, when God had something really, really, really important to say, he would send his most important and most powerful angels. And Gabriel was one of those. So he entrusts Gabriel to go to Mary and give this message to her and let her know that she is going to be the one that is going to carry this Messiah, this king, this king who's going to rule over his people. And his kingdom is going to last forever. So it's an important message, really important message that he entrusted it to his, one of his most faithful and most powerful angels. So we see in this message that he gives about Jesus, that the Lord God was going to give him legitimate authority and power as a king. So he's going to sit on his father David's throne. David was king over Israel, anointed by the prophet to become the king. This is legitimate. This isn't, he doesn't overthrow, uh, you know, governments and things like that in order to gain power. No, this is power which is given directly by God, anointed by God to be king. This is legitimate authority that he's got. And a king is the highest ruler. Isn't that the case? I mean, there is nobody higher than the king. The king is the top of the heap, right? The capa grande, right? The don, right? There's nobody higher than the king in authority. So he's the highest ruler. And as we know, one of the titles that Jesus has is that not only is he king, but he's the king of kings. He's the king of kings. So this isn't just a king amongst many kings. This is the king ruler over all kings and over all kingdoms. And of course, Gabriel then says that his reign and his kingdom would last forever. So this is not just a, an ordinary ruler. This isn't just somebody who's going to come and they're going to reign for five years, 20 years, 60 years, and then die. And they're going to be succeeded by somebody else. No, this king was going to be established and him and his kingdom would last forever. I mean, that can only mean this is God. Because only God lasts forever. Only God's kingdom reigns forever. What we find then is that Jesus, at his baptism, receives this authority and receives this power for his kingdom. And in Luke chapter 4, and verse 18 to 19, Jesus gives his inaugural address. This is after, after he's been and seen John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist 
uh, saw the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus and landing upon him and remaining with him. All right? that, was, that was Jesus' anointing ceremony. In the same way that when we have a coronation of a king, they get anointed with oil. Very specific. The, 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 the imagery is taken straight out from the scriptures here. And Jesus in, uh, is in, in, uh, in Nazareth and he gives this address. Luke 4, 18 and 19. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will go free, and that the time of the Lord's favour has come. So this was Jesus giving this declaration as to what this anointing was all about. When he says anointed me, he has anointed me. That is a direct reference to the anointing oil in the Old Testament, which was used to commission either the high priest or the king. So if we read about Aaron, for example, Aaron's head was anointed. And uh, there's a psalm that says the, the oil of that anointing ran down onto his beard and went all the way down to his feet. And when we see a king being anointed like David, what did Samuel do? Samuel went and he anointed David with oil as a sign that he was the king. And oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So we see this symbol of the Holy Spirit is what gives that anointing, that legitimacy to Jesus' kingship as he begins to start on his on being the king. So the Holy Spirit, we see, is the seal of legitimate authority and power in the kingdom. That's what it was for. And that's what we see with Jesus. So what do we find then is Jesus then moves from that place of being baptized with the Holy Spirit, moving out, then past this inaugural speech that he gives. We see him going around Israel in his ministry. Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, went around proclaiming God's kingdom reign and rule had come. That's what he did. Everywhere he went, he proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. And he demonstrated that the kingdom was here by doing signs and wonders. In Luke 4, in verse 36, Luke summarises the feeling of the people. They were amazed, the people exclaimed, what authority and power this man's words possess. Even evil spirits obey him, and they flee at his command. Why were they amazed at what Jesus was doing? Why were they amazed at the miracles that he saw? Because nobody up until then had the same authority that Jesus did. People just didn't go around casting demons out. People didn't just go around healing the sick, raising the dead, preaching as if he had authority. They just didn't do it. They'd never seen this before. There was something about Jesus which was completely different to everything and anything that they'd seen before, including those who were in authority, including those who were the scribes, the Pharisees, the, the temple priests, all these people that served God. They didn't have this kind of authority. They didn't do the things that Jesus did. That's why they were so amazed. And what struck them the most was that even his words carried power. His words had authority. He didn't just come, you know, with sword and shield and a mighty army and, uh, and, and make everybody submit to what he said. No, he just spoke a word and demons flee. That's authority. That's authority in action. And that's what they saw. The power of the Holy Spirit was the sign of his authority. So when they saw the power that his words had, when they saw the effect that his words had, that was the sign that he had authority. And every time he did a sign, every time he did a wonder, every time he 
did a miracle. Every time the demons were cast out, it was a proclamation. A proclamation that the illegitimate rule of Satan was coming to an end. Because Satan up until that point had had authority, as we've already said, over all people that had been born under sin. And we saw Jesus went around setting people free. Setting them free from the power of darkness. Free from the authority of the enemy. And every time that happens, Satan's reminded again, your rule, your reign, illegitimate, is coming to an end. Jesus demonstrated his rule and his reign over physical creation. He did this by commanding the wind and the waves to be still. Who else had done that? Nobody had done that before. Not only that, I mean, you know, he also walked on water, right? There were miraculous signs that Jesus did. How many people remember the story of Jesus calming the wind and the waves? What was the, what was the reaction of his disciples in the boat after they did that? They were scared. They were really scared. They said, who is this person that even the wind and the waves obey him? Such was the authority that Jesus had. He had authority even over the natural elements of creation. Only God can do that. No one else can do that. Only God can do that. And that's what they began to realize who Jesus was. That this wasn't just a man. This wasn't just somebody who, who came and was teaching us how to live nice lives, right? Teaching us how to love our neighbor. No, he had authority. An authority that was above the authorities that they knew before. He commanded the wind and the waves to be still. He cursed the fig tree and the fig tree withered. There was miracles of feeding 5,000 people at a time. And he also commanded uh, Peter to go fishing so that he could find a temple tax to go and pay. But that's a miracle. So Jesus demonstrated his kingdom and his authority through these miracles. He also went about healing lepers, the blind, the mute, he commanded bacteria and viruses to leave people's bodies. And he corrected faulty genetics. Have you thought about that? Because that's what he did. That's using our vernacular, our terms, right? They didn't know about bacteria in those days, but we do. Even Jesus has authority over bacteria. So all of these things, he demonstrates his rule and his reign over physical creation. Do you know what? Even death had no authority over Jesus. Even death was not beyond the scope of his authority because he was the resurrection and the life. So even when Lazarus died, he called him out of the grave. So not even death itself had mastery over Jesus, over the extent and the scope of his kingdom. There's nothing, nothing under all of creation, under all the heavens, which is outside of the scope of his authority. And King Jesus demonstrated his rule and his reign over the kingdom of the devil by driving out demons and destroying the works of darkness everywhere he went. And ultimately, he did this by dying on the cross to break the shackles of sin. As we've already seen, as we've already demonstrated through communion. As of that which was bound us, sin, even the death of Christ, broke the power of sin and death free up of our lives. And through his resurrection, he's been delivering people out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his light. That's worth shouting about. <laughs> right there. So if you ever needed to be convinced that authority 
is primarily spiritual. Think about this. John 10 and verse 18. Jesus says, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. When did Jesus take his life up again? Right. Three days after he was dead. (laughs) Jesus wasn't resurrected while he was alive. He came back from the dead after his physical body was already in the grave and in the tomb. Three days later. So that, to me, says the authority of Christ doesn't rest in his physical body. It actually rests in his eternal spirit. And through his eternal spirit, he said, right, now I'm going to rise from the dead. And not only did he just appear, you know, as a disembodied spirit, he commanded that dead body to become a new creation. And Christ rose from the dead. That's spiritual. That's not physical. Dead people don't bring themselves back from the dead. So authority is primarily spiritual. And we spoke about that last week. So Jesus delegates authority and power to his disciples. So we've had a look and we've seen already that that not only was it prophesied that Jesus was going to be a king, that he was going to be a ruler, that he was going to rule and reign over his people, his kingdom was going to last forever. But Jesus also then delegates power to his disciples and authority. So we've already seen last time that all legitimate authority is delegated. All legitimate authority is delegated, even with Jesus. Even with Jesus, we see that Jesus submitted himself to the Father in all things. Jesus said, I do nothing and I say nothing unless I hear and see my Father in heaven do it first. So Jesus never acted independently of the Father. He always acted under authority, under the power of the Holy Spirit. So even with Jesus, although he is King of kings and Lord of lords, he always acted under authority because his authority was delegated, delegated to him by the Father through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus does that with his servants. Jesus delegated authority to his disciples so that they could continue his mission and to extend the rule and reign of Jesus throughout the earth. In Matthew 10, verse 1 and then verse 7 to 8, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and he gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Verse 7. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons, as freely as you have received freely give. So I want you to note here that this is before they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We know that the baptism of the Holy Spirit happened at Pentecost, So that didn't happen until actually Jesus had already risen and gone to be with the Father. So this was, this is while Jesus was still on earth. So how could they have done the things which Jesus told them to go and do? They did it because he delegated authority to them to go ahead and do it. Because the Holy Spirit was in him. They were acting as his emissaries, his ministers. Go out and do the things that I've done. I've shown you how to do it. You've been walking with me. I've been teaching you. I've been discipling you. Now, here's the authority to go and do it. And he sent them out. Jesus defined the scope of their authority. He didn't just give them power to go out and do whatever they wanted to do any old time, right? That wasn't just unlimited power was given to them or unlimited authority. He defined the scope 
of their authority and what they were to do. And they found that when they acted within the scope of what he told them to do, they found the power was there. They had given the authority, delegated, the power was there when they acted within the scope of their authority. So they found that when they went and laid hands on the sick, they were healed. They found that when they told demons to leave, they left. And they came back because, wow, <laughs> it works. <laughs> That's what you set us out to do and it actually works. A little after Jesus sent out the 12, he then takes a larger number of his disciples. He takes not just the 12, not just the, you know, those who were in his most inner circle. He then chooses 70 of his disciples. And he tells them to go and do the same. Defines the scope of what they were to do and how they were to do it and what they were to take and what they weren't to take. And they went out and they found that as they went out as well doing what Jesus had given them authority to do, they found not only did they have authority, but they also had the power of the Holy Spirit to back up what had been what they'd been asked to do. And the Bible tells us that they came back rejoicing. Because even, even demons did what they commanded them to do. See, while Jesus was on earth. He was able to delegate authority to whomever he chose to because he had the authority to delegate. But was that delegation of authority only for those disciples? Or were you included in that as well? That's a good question. It's one that's worth answering. At Jesus' ascension, Jesus would return to the Father and he would leave his disciples on earth to continue as his ministers on earth, ministers of his kingdom. And just as Jesus waited for authority and power to come upon him at his baptism, we also need to be baptized in the Spirit as the seal of our authority and the power of the kingdom as well. Jesus didn't exercise his kingship until after his baptism. In Matthew 28, verse 18, this is the Great Commission. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. It's a good way of starting out something, isn't it? Right? By establishing your credentials. Right? Any, any, good, uh, any good person who comes and, and speaks always makes sure they establish your credentials first. So Jesus established his credentials, right? All authority and power and the heaven and earth has been given to me, right? There's nothing being left out, right? I've, I've got it all, right? So here we go. Therefore, because I have all authority and I have all power, go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even until the end of the age. So this is the Great Commission. This was given before the Ascension. And what do we find here? Jesus delegates authority to those who are left as his ministers to all those that were there and according to another scripture there were about 500 that were there and witnessed the ascension so to all them that were there he says he delegates authority to them and then he defines the scope of their authority so just as Jesus waited for authority and power to come upon him at his baptism we also need to be baptized in the Spirit as the seal of our authority. In Acts 1, verses 4 to 5 and 8, this is Luke's version of the Ascension and the Great Commission. It says, Once, 
When he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so here Luke tells a, a slightly different facet of the story. But what he says here is he says, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will also receive power. And as we saw with Jesus, when Jesus exercised power, power was a sign of his authority. So Jesus says to those who are baptized in the Spirit, you will receive power. What's that a sign of? Authority. See, you don't get power without authority. And you don't get authority without power. What's the point in having authority if you've got no power to execute? None whatsoever. It's just a badge. You might as well just sort of, you know, wear a sticker, right? Or, or a pin, you know, with your title on it for all that's worth. If you've got no power to execute what it is you've been given authority or responsibility over, then what's good is that? There's a slide here. That word power in the Greek is called dunamis. And it's where we get the word dynamite. Dynamite. That's the kind of power the Holy Spirit has. It's explosive dynamite power. All right? This isn't just, you know, little pfft. This is an explosion, right? It's real power. Real power that God gives. Dynamite, dunamis, power. So with authority comes the power to continue the ministry of Jesus. What's that going to look like? In Mark 16 and verse 15 to 18, Jesus again, just before he goes uh, up into heaven, he's telling his disciples, giving them the commission. This is Mark's version. And he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety, and they will drink any they will drink anything poisonous and it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. So again, Jesus defines the scope of what it is that they're to do and says you've got the authority to do that. Go and do it, and you'll find as you do it, the power of the Holy Spirit will be present to do what you've been sent to do. Yeah. So is Mark talking about signs following just the original disciples? Yeah. Is that all he's talking about? He's just talking about the 12? Or is he talking about the 70? Or is this only the 500? Or is this only the first couple of centuries? Well, what does Jesus say? He's talking about the newly saved. The newly saved. Not the old saved. Not those who've been hanging around for a long time. He's talking about the newly saved believers. Those who have been baptised in the Spirit. Or as John puts it in chapter 3, born again. Because we know that the moment a person receives the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour, they are born again. And that can only happen if you've been baptised in the Spirit. So you must be born again. You must be baptised in the Spirit. They're two different languages for the same thing. This is what he's talking about. So miraculous signs will accompany spirit-baptized people. If you belong to Jesus, then you have been sealed 
with the Holy Spirit. And you have the power to be a minister in his kingdom. You've got the right to exercise your delegated authority and to use it within the scope that's been given to you for the advancement of the kingdom. Power, authority, hasn't been given to you to spend it on yourself. That's outside the scope, right? Always when Jesus delegates, he defines the scope. And nowhere in there does it say that you can use whatever authority, power, influence, whatever it is that you've got for your own ends and your own gain. No, you're there to be a minister for the advancement of the gospel. That's what it's there for. That's what we've been called to do. So will you, what will you do with the authority that you have? Because we've seen that that authority has been given to you. So what are you going to do with that authority? Thank you.